Every Friday as the sun sets, Jews all over the world celebrate the Sabbath. But in Russia, Jews have not been allowed to celebrate their religion. Prejudice and hatred made it necessary for thousands to escape Russia and immigrate to America. The history of Jews is a history of immigration. Anatoly Iolfe and his family fled Russia in 1991. But when Russia is democratic, I think that um, people would start working together and, and um, achieve great results. And they will see that killing Jews will not make food suddenly appear in the stores. The first Jews who came to America weren't persecuted immigrants. They were seamen who sailed to America with Christopher Columbus in 1492. The voyage was financed by Jewish investors. Portland attorney Alan Abravanel is a descendant of Don Isaac Abravanel, one of the Jewish merchants who financed Columbus. Abravanel was responsible for his gaining access to uh, the court. Uh, it's ironic to note that when Columbus finally did set sail westward, his ship was unable to leave from one of the major ports of Spain because, as Columbus notes, the pathways were clogged with ships carrying Jews who were being exiled from Spain at the same time. The Spanish Inquisition was a time of persecution against anyone who wasn't Catholic. Thousands of Spanish and Portuguese Jews, called Sephardic Jews, fled to other European countries between 1492 and the 1650s. In 1654, a small group of 23 Sephardic Jews landed in New Amsterdam, which was later called New York. They had escaped religious persecution in Europe, only to experience it again in America, when the Calvinist governor of the new American colony, Peter Stuyvesant, tried to expel them. The 23 Sephardic Jews remained and built the first synagogue in America in 1730. Jews continued to immigrate, and by 1820, there were 5,000 Jewish settlers in America. Jews supported the American Revolution. They were fighting for the cherished ideal of religious freedom as well as individual liberty. President George Washington, after independence had been won, gave his personal word to the Jewish community. The government gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution, no assistance. The economic situation in Germany and Bavaria was depressed. When anti-Semitic riots took place in several cities, a quarter million German Jews immigrated to America. Among the first Jews to arrive and settle in Oregon were Jacob Goldsmith and Louis May, who arrived in 1849 and opened a general store. They found Portland to be a small village of a few hundred people with about 25 houses, a few stores, and tree stumps everywhere. In the 1850s, the gold rush brought more young Jewish men to California and eventually to Oregon. They found a decent living peddling to miners, but peddling from town to town was a hard life. Sigmund Heilner wrote to his father in Germany on a dreary Oregon evening in January 1860. Dear father, rain almost all day. Spent the day as usual, stayed home and read. I'm not inclined to pay visit to the miners. I'm longing to come home. Good night, sweet thoughts. Your loving son, Sigmund. His father, Aaron Heilner, wrote back from Bavaria. Beloved son, Sigmund, how I wish you would return and establish yourself in Germany, where, where people live like human beings. You are the apple of my eye, your loving father, Aaron Heilner. Sigmund chose not to return home. Instead, he moved to Baker, Oregon, where he became a successful banker and merchant. But his family in Germany and their descendants all perished during World War II in the Nazi Holocaust. In 1853, the first Jewish woman arrived in Portland. Her name was Mrs. Weinshank and she opened a boarding house for Jewish bachelors. One poor peddler at that time was young Aaron Meyer of today's Meyer and Frank store. I began as a peddler, riding on my mule to small settlements. In one, they had a single needle to darn the clothes of every family. One September, that needle broke. I said, my people don't celebrate Christmas, but maybe you would like an early Christmas present? So I took out a thin packet 
and gave every one of those families a darning needle. Aaron opened a store in 1857 and was eventually very successful. He died in 1889 at the age of 58. His wife, Jeanette, and his family carried on the business. Myron Frank became the largest department store in the Northwest. It was one of Portland's first skyscrapers. The modern Myron Frank was completed in 1932. Bernard Goldsmith was the first Jewish mayor of Portland from 1869 to 1871. His most lasting contribution to Portland is Washington Park. I knew that people would find the park a great asset. Back then they were upset. I paid $500 an acre for the first 40 acres. They said, there's wilderness everywhere. Why buy more? I just knew the city would grow and I wanted to save something of the wilderness for the descendants of Portland. The next great wave of immigration to America was the Eastern European Jews who arrived between 1880 and 1920. For centuries, the Jews of Eastern Europe had been subject to the tyranny of Russian czars and to the violence of Christian peasants. Russian Jews were confined in tiny, poor villages called shtetls in an area of Western Russia called the Pale of Settlement. In 1881, when Alexander III ascended the throne, official Russian policy became strongly anti-Semitic. Under the new regime, devastating pogroms, terrible massacres took place. From these tiny villages, one and a half million Jews escaped from Eastern Europe to America in overcrowded boats. Many of these Eastern European Jews made their way west and settled in South Portland. They recreated their warm family life centered around their religion. With the help of German Jews who were already settled around Oregon, the newer Eastern European Jews educated themselves out of the vulnerable position of poverty. They became a stable, vibrant ethnic community in South Portland. I wonder if people understand what a neighborhood really was and what a neighborhood should be, where there is that spirit of helping and it's always present. The South Portland was a neighborhood. It was a neighborhood for Jewish people, as well as for the Italians, as well as for the Greeks who lived there. And people went out of their way to help and to assist if it was needed. Um, on the other hand, um, children would children felt really quite comfortable in dropping in. Everybody dropped in. If you dropped in, then somebody would serve a cup of coffee. I once asked a woman who always served, I said, do you like to eat? And she said, no. She said, I like to feed people. And that, I think, was more or less the tradition. South Portland was a very poor neighborhood. However, nobody knew they were poor because everybody was in the same straits. The streetcar cost five cents. They would not take the streetcar. They would walk instead because that saved five cents. Boys hawked newspapers and brought the money back to the family. And monies were pooled. I sold newspapers for two cents, and I kept one for myself. When I made a quarter, I could buy food for my parents. Meat? Meat was 10 cents a pound in those days. If you earn 50 cents, you could feed a family of six. And the idea was, from cradle to grave, we will take care of our own. And it is not the responsibility of one person or one family, but it is a community responsibility that we have. And that is that has permeated Jewish consciousness, that I am indeed my brother's keeper. The Jewish women of this earlier German Jewish and Polish Jewish immigration were very, very benevolent with Neighborhood House. The Council of Jewish Women started Neighborhood House. And the idea for Neighborhood House was as a self-help organization. It was this institution that, that single-handedly took these young immigrant children and taught them in shops, in dance classes, in English classes. And there are many, many, many stories of people like Gussie Reinhardt who had danced and then was given a scholarship so she could go on to New York and pursue her dance studies. And the two things in this area that I remember very well and that are very dear to my heart today as they were when I was a child is uh, our failing school and this synagogue. 
failing school because it was such a wonderful school for all the mixed people, children that uh, went there. And of course it w was such an excellent place because of the principal who was Fanny Porter. Fanny Porter was a, a very compassionate and a loving uh, person. But if you did something that you shouldn't have done, then you got a real uppercut. And, when, and she'd usually give you the uppercut when you were talking, so you really bit your tongue. Today, traditional religious and secular education is available to the children at the Portland Jewish Academy. It's housed in the Middleman Jewish Community Center that provides some of the same services to the new immigrants that the old neighborhood house used to in South Portland. Jewish newspapers served Portland beginning in 1893. Today, the Jewish Review carries on that tradition. The first temple in Portland was begun in 1858 by some of Mrs. Weinshank's boarders. They called it Beth Israel. It went through many transformations before finding a permanent home on Northwest Flanders. Many synagogues and temples were established in Portland. They were organized by different waves of immigrants. Some disbanded, some merged with other congregations, but the ones that remain today have become the stronghold of Judaism in Portland. Temple Beth Israel represents Reform Judaism. Neva Shalom carries on the conservative movement. Sherry Torah is traditional. Avad Achim was built by the Sephardic Jews. It is Orthodox, as is Kesser Israel. The area called South Portland was from Front Street to Fifth, from Harrison to Barber. The community of South Portland lasted for 50 years until urban renewal replaced the neighborhood with high rises and modern structures. The area that survives from that time is Lair Hill, with the old park, the library, the neighborhood house, and the old homes. By the early 1920s, Jewish immigration to America was severely restricted by national legislation. At the same time, anti-Semitic forces were growing around the world and began surfacing as Nazism in Germany in the 1930s. The same intolerance that drove the Jews from Europe was now beginning in Oregon. By the early 1920s, Portland had become a center for Ku Klux Klan activity. The Klan was blatantly opposed to Jews and blacks, but focused primarily on Catholics. By the late 1920s, the Klan had disappeared as a political force, but anti-Semitism remained. With the rise of Hitler and Nazism, it became less fashionable in Oregon to be overtly anti-Semitic. Hitler began his campaign of genocide by making laws against minorities. Hitler's final solution for the Jews was to create death camps specifically for the mass murder of over six million Jewish men, women, and children. By the 1940s, the concentration camps had been liberated and word of the Holocaust reached Oregon as the survivors began arriving. Shella Kreisig was one of the survivors. On my 12th birthday, the Germans marched into Holland. That was the beginning of a terrorized life for the next few years. And you know, I always had nightmares. All the time in hiding, I had nightmares. And so I go to sleep, and early in the morning hours, I'm waken up by a loud banging noise on the door. Bang, 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 open the door, open the door. And I put the shit over my head and I thought, oh my God, what is this? And I heard the boots coming up the stairs, up the attic, up towards the attic room, and the door opens with a big noise. And they said, where is the family fell? There are four of them, Flora, Shella, and they called out the name of my parents. And I put the shit over my head and I would not take it away. And my father, got out of the bed, and he said, Shella, get up. And I said, no, it is my nightmare. It's my nightmare. I'm we going to wake up from this. And he said, no, Shella, it is not a nightmare. They've come to get us. And the Nazis were there to come and get us. Somebody had betrayed us. Nobody from the family, nobody had come back. They had all been killed. And we were saved. We came through the war floor and I, but we survived and we made our life count. Out of such terrible events came the founding of Israel, a Jewish homeland, 
where Jews hoped they would be able to build their lives in peace. The founding of a homeland for the Jews in Israel brought the Jewish community in Oregon together as nothing had before. There was a profound sense of Jews sharing a common destiny through the overwhelming events of the decade. I, I wept. I wept with a mixture of joy and uh, gratefulness that it was during my lifetime that I saw a Jewish homeland reestablished. It was really quite a privilege for those of us who uh, understood that the Jew needed a homeland. And the Holocaust proved it. Perhaps because Jews had been denied civil liberties for so many centuries, they were drawn to public service. Jews have served Oregon in almost every elected position, including U.S. senators, U.S. congressmen, governors, and judges. There have been Jewish mayors elected in 14 Oregon cities and towns. In 1993, Vera Katz was elected Portland's first Jewish woman mayor. There was a whole issue of Sadaka. I hope I'm even pronouncing it correctly, uh, which is the need for us to give back to the community what the community has given to us. And I was very fortunate. Uh, my family arrived here during World War II uh, with basically nothing in our hands uh, except some love and care from strangers who welcome us. And it was very important for me to return back to the community what a lot of good people gave to us as we arrived to America in 1940. From 1972 to 1979, Neil Goldschmidt was mayor, and in 1987 he was elected governor. He was instrumental in bringing about light rail, which changed the face of Portland. There is a religious uh, book called the Talmud in my religion, and it says if you save one child, you save the world. It doesn't say save a Jewish child. It doesn't say save a Catholic child or a Muslim child or a black or a white child. It doesn't say anything. It just says save one child. And the message to me in all of that is that every human being's life is of great value. Everybody around us is important to us. We are no stronger, really, than the weakest link amongst us. And if somebody out there is being treated badly simply because we have this idea in our head that they are different, that's prejudice. And for anybody who's ever suffered from it a little because they were redheaded or they were black or they were something, you don't like it. It affects the way you think about your opportunities. From the 1950s on, the Jews of Oregon were a well-established community. The German merchants of the 19th century and the dynamic Eastern European immigrants of the early 20th century had blended into one Jewish community. Besides establishing successful businesses, Jews entered the sports world when Harry Glickman and his partners brought the Trailblazers to Portland in 1970. Jews retain a deep and abiding sense of being Jewish, a sense of who they are. It was written that their survival lies not in their geography, but in their history. As a people, no matter what country they're from, traditions bind them together. And it is perhaps this sense of self that has allowed Jews to reach out and participate so fully in the building of Oregon for the future, for the children of Oregon. Some 